Once upon a time, there was a peasant. He had a hard, hard life, working all year round, little better off than a slave, and with no say in what went on. He was diseased, he was downtrodden, and he was dirty. <laughs> Who on earth would want to have been a medieval peasant? Being a peasant in the Middle Ages must qualify as the worst job in history. But of course we're only guessing, because being peasants, they didn't leave behind much record of their existence. Well, except once, in the summer of 1381, the peasants left an indelible mark on the history of England. The peasants' revolt took everyone by surprise. It was quite astonishing. From out of nowhere, it seemed, tens of thousands of peasants arrived in Blackheath on the outskirts of London and demanded the king abolish all forms of servitude, taxation and the aristocracy. The king, who was only 14 at the time, quite understandably said he'd need to think it over. The peasants, however, wanted liberty, equality and brotherhood. And when did they want it? Now! 400 years before the French Revolution. Talk about pushing. The king, who'd been talking to the rebels from the safety of a barge in the middle of the river, decided to go home for his tea. The peasants obviously needed to make their point more forcibly. So they rampaged through London, killing lots of Flemish people. Oh, not quite sure how that helped. One group broke into the Tower of London. They burst into the royal living quarters. And there, according to the tabloids of the time, they sat on the beds and poked into everything with their filthy sticks. Some of them even tried to kiss the king's mother. They then dragged the Archbishop of Canterbury and the treasurer out of the White Tower and cut off their heads, which they paraded round the town stuck on poles. Now, if it sounds to you like the lunatics have taken over the asylum, that's what a lot of people at the time thought. But they weren't lunatics. The peasants' agenda was informed, tactical and, most of all, political. They targeted lawyers and court officials. They made bonfires of legal and tax records. They were deliberately erasing their servile past. How could such a wretched group of underlings have organised such a sophisticated attack? After all, they were only a bunch of bloody peasants, weren't they? Medieval feudal society was a pyramid with the king at the top and the peasants at the bottom doing all the hard work. Nobody, not even the lords, owned any land. They simply had the use of it as long as they provided military service for the king. <laughs> The peasants toiled in the fields, supporting those with more important things to do, like uh, praying and fighting each other. Yeah, it's an excellent system, if you ask me. <laughs> Stinking peasants. But since the lord of the manor was often away from his estate, fighting in the king's wars, he had to be able to rely on his peasants to organise themselves. In many ways, a medieval peasant had more say in how his life was run than most people do now. Of course, it's a way of life that's all gone. We'll never know what it was really like to live under such a system. Except where I'm going now. The village of Laxton in Nottinghamshire is the only place in England that still works on the medieval system. The centre of which is the so-called court leet, elected every year by the village farmers in medieval times, it had the power to formulate bylaws, collect rents, and maintain law and order. Today, the court's only job is to police the way the land is farmed. Once a year, on jury day, the jurors head out to check that no one is breaking any of the rules. The land is farmed in strips, in the same way as it was 800 years ago and each farmer's strip of land is separated not by fences, but by grassy borders of common land, known as six. This little green strip of grass is the dividing furrow between the two strips. This one belongs to Mr. Godson and that one belongs to Mr. Noble. What do you mean, it's not straight? Well, no, it's <laughs> <fence>. <laughs> Wiggly. 
I imagine we're going to be a big, you know, it's not a couple of yards of uh, nice grass. <laughs> and woe betide anyone caught ignoring these boundaries. As soon as we got there, an offence was spotted. A stray piece of turf. What do you think's left this here, Roy? Oh, to be put oh, back. Put back in, yeah. yeah. So this is what you call uh, soil on the common land. Yeah, yeah. Shoveling yeah. in. Shoveling in. Shoveling in. Oh, yeah. What you call shoveling in. Yeah. But we don't put it back in. Whoever's done it should, should have done it. That is a serious, yeah. serious offence. So how much do you think they'll get fined for that then, right? Oh, about two pounds, I think. Yeah. It's quite stiff, actually. Yeah. <laughs> Then down to the serious matter of marking out the boundaries of each farmer's land, using the same high-tech methods developed in the Middle Ages, which leave plenty of room for debate. To there, where Oller is, look. See you. There. Yeah. I reckon you want to be there. Five. Offences such as ploughing over boundaries are taken very seriously and will be judged at the meeting of the court, a solemn affair which takes place, as it has done for centuries, in the local pub. Right then, gentlemen, I'll call the court to order. Oh yay, oh yay, oh yay. All manner of persons who owe suit and service to the court lead of the Queen's Most Excellent Majesty, draw near and give your attendance. God save the Queen and the Lord of this court lead. The presentment shows the dikes are satisfactory. There's a fine of £10 uh, on Stuart Rose for plying too far into the meadow ends sick. So, Mr Rose, do you have any comment on that? Yeah, well, that, that was... I, I ploughed to an original peg, which was already in the, uh, in the sick. So I thought I was ploughing in the right place, and I think the £10 fine is a bit harsh. Do you but, accept that it was the wrong place now? Yeah, slightly, but yeah, yeah. but um, I was ploughing to where it had been marked out. Any comments from anyone else? I think the fine should stand. Well, in medieval times, like, yeah. a man could be tried for murder in this court. Right at the time. Well, the proposal of the court then is to reduce the fine from ten pounds to five pounds. Everyone in favour? Yes. 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 Of course, it suited the lords to leave all this petty legal stuff to the peasants to sort out for themselves. But there was a snag. The experience of dealing with the law and enforcing it sometimes meant that the peasants became minor legal experts in their own right. And when they did, they used that expertise to their own ends. Sometimes, however, they resorted to rather unconventional tactics. For example, in 1200, King John proposed a visit to the city of Nottingham. The residents of the nearby village of Gotham realised that this meant he would pass through their village, making it a king's highway and thus making them liable to new taxes. So when the king's messengers arrived, what did they do? Well, the entire village pretended to be mad. Since madness was considered contagious, the idea of a whole village of lunatics was perfectly feasible, and the king wisely decided to make a detour. But for all their cunning, surely peasants were still nothing more than slaves. In the same way that the lord of the manor had to provide military service to the king, the peasants had to provide the lord of the manor with so many days' labour in return for the land they held from him. Historians have given this arrangement the catchy title of feudal burden. But just how much of a burden were these feudal duties? For example, the peasants who ploughed these fields six or seven hundred years ago bore one of the heaviest feudal burdens in the kingdom. That is to say, they had to work for the lord of the manor for something like 50 to 60 days in the year to provide their accommodation and pay their taxes. Nowadays, uh, most of these fields are occupied by the BMW car plant. Now, to pay for their rent and taxes today, an assembly line worker has to work for something like 80 days in the year. That's nearly a month longer than the worst off medieval peasants. What's more, the feudal arrangement was a two way thing. The Lord had responsibilities to his peasants. In fact, twice a year he was supposed to lay on feasts for them as a sort of thank you. I can't remember the last time the taxman took me out for slap-up dinner. 
or a picnic. Of course, the lord of the manor lived like a lord. But what kind of a stinking hovel would its peasants have called home? The answer can be found at Britain's newest, oldest village, Cosmaston, on the outskirts of Cardiff, where a team of archaeologists have painstakingly recreated a complete medieval village. There's a surprising range of properties on offer. First up, a medieval bachelor pad, or rather, an affordable studio apartment suitable for the single working peasant. Oh, must be pretty unpleasant life, must not it? It could be quite grim, but again, we've got to get rid of all of our modern views on what makes a good life. Uh, so this is the, how the lowest of the low would live. Yeah, we're right at the bottom here. Yeah. Well, it's quite spacious, really. Well, that's right, he has a nice little cottage, but that's about all he has going for him. Yeah. So what does he do? This, uh, he's a landless labourer. Here's a chap who's his land taken bottom, away bottom of the right at the bottom. And so he's got a, a fire. He's cooking himself something. Yeah, very basic pot here above his half. Tiny amounts of wood that be used. None of the roaring fires that we'd think of because all of his wood has to pay the Lord of the Man a wood penny, go out into the woods and he can just collect what's fallen. And he's got a bed, I see. Delightful bed here, uh. with just a mattress full of straw thrown on top of it and a couple of rough old woolen blankets. There's plenty of fleas, I expect. Hopefully Sorry. not too bad, because hanging above them, we have some flea bane. Oh. So in theory, that keeps the fleas away. Oh. 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 If that was the bottom of the bottom of the heap, what was it like on the top of the bottom of the heap? Next on the tour, an upmarket, semi-detached family home. A decidedly des res for the upwardly mobile professional peasant couple. So whose house is this, Nick? Now this is the Reeves house. And what's a Reeves? So, Tell me what We're going up market is. here. Every yeah. year, the free men of the village yeah. vote yeah. for who they want to be the Reeves. Yeah. And the Reeve is almost like a village manager. Keeps an eye on things, makes sure that everybody's farming the land properly. Yeah. This is a wealthy man, a wealthy villager. He doesn't make his money out of being Reeve. He owns a lot of land. That's right. He is the Land Rover yeah. Green Welly farmer. And a very, very upper-class uh, fireplace. Oh, he can yeah. afford it. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. A Welsh dresser, I see. Uh, very important, especially <laughs> for the Reeves' wife. The <laughs> first thing you see as you come in is her fine pottery display. So she's showing it off to everybody. Showing her jugs off to everybody. How rich I am. Exactly. <laughs> we have some nice examples here. This one is Saint-Onge pottery. Sounds French to me. That's right, this has come up from the Bordeaux region, yeah. probably as part of the wine trade from that area. Anybody amongst the peasants is going to be drinking wine. It's going to be the Reeve and his family. Doesn't sound that bad to me. Then maybe, maybe I could be a medieval peasant. I'll, I'll think about it. Strip wood floors, shelves of holiday knickknacks, and a nice drop of Bordeaux wine. Maybe the medieval ideal home wasn't so different from today's. But I'm still a bit nervous about what they had to eat. It's this pottage. Hmm. Evidently, the recipe for pottage is take anything and put it into a pan of water and boil it up for two hours. Now, the reason you have to boil everything you pick out of the fields for two hours is because they used human excrement on the fields. So even uh, lettuce had to be boiled, which made the salads rather soggy. Anyway, let's try the pottage. <laughs> well, <laughs> it's uh, pretty disgusting. Um, but you could have um, cheered it up, I suppose, with um, a few herbs, maybe even some garlic. They also had an instant form of pottage, and you could take this into the fields with you, and then you could uh, liquefy it with a bit of beer and uh, eat that if you wanted to. Anyway, the good news about being a peasant was that you got to drink plenty of beer. Um, they didn't have hops until 1420, when they were imported from Flanders. So before that, you had to flavour the beer with uh, other things, uh, like bog myrtle, this one's flavoured with. Um, it's basically the same sort of stuff. Let's have a, a taste of that. Of course, they, they tended to drink uh, alcoholic drinks rather than water, because the uh, water was uh, usually not very drinkable. Um, oh, oh, that's very nice, actually. Every village was dominated by its church, and the peasants' social life revolved around it. Mm -hmm. 
The medieval church certainly knew how to attract a congregation. It was the place where the peasants had their parties, where they did their amateur dramatics, and where they even held football matches. Oh, and the local priest often used to brew his own beer, which is certainly more of a draw than playing the guitar. And the church expected its peasants to be duly grateful. Here in Painswick, Gloucestershire, a rather quaint ceremony has survived from medieval times. Peasants would show their love of the church by giving it a big hug. Well, welcome everyone to this year's clipping service. Well, I think uh, we have our arms right the way round the church. And so now we're going to embrace, or we're going to clip our lovely church. Another reason they were so fond of the church may have been that it provided plenty of holidays, or rather, holy days. If you thought we have more leisure time today, think again. Nowadays, we enjoy eight public holidays a year. In the Middle Ages, the church insisted on 80. Well, a clearer picture of peasant lifestyle seems to be emerging. But I wanted to really get under their skin, so I was introduced to some real-life medieval peasants. Far from being sickly and diseased, forensic studies have revealed that the inhabitants of a remote Yorkshire village received surprisingly sophisticated health care. What about this chap here? We've got a skull with a big hole in the middle of it. Right, well, this is absolutely extraordinary. What this seems to be is a, a cranial injury that was treated by neurological surgery. This individual suffered a blunt injury to the head just around the time of the Norman Conquest. Yeah. Where this hole is, that would have been where the bone was shattered into small fragments. And if you look carefully at this, you yeah. can see where the surgeon made his incision. Really? Oh, oh, oh. Oh, the guy's been hit on the head, and the surgeon said, I've got to get rid of those pieces of fragments of skull. They mm. knew that was bad to have the fragments of skull. Exactly, there. yes. So this guy's wandering around with a hole in his head. Oh, yes, yes. I mean, this, this would have been covered by his scalp. Um, or a but... bit of skin would have grown over it. Oh, yes, yes, exactly. Yes, he wouldn't have had a hole right through to the brain. Um, and he'd been perfectly all right. Yeah. The bones reveal that some peasants lived well into their 60s, and whilst there are signs of malnutrition, their diet did have its benefits. One of the, the upsides is that they did have quite good dental health. Um, there is very little tooth decay, and we can see That's here, because they're not having sugar and stuff like that. They're not having sugar, and also it's yeah. sort of a very coarse diet, which tends to scour the teeth clean. Yeah. And we can see this here, and that means that there's no chance for dental decay to get started. But a toothbrush still wouldn't have gone amiss in some cases. If we look at this one here, as you can see, these huge shaggy deposits on the teeth. Oh, it's disgusting. Right, well, this is actually mineralised dental plaque. <laughs> this has accumulated over the years yeah. of his life. And that shows quite clearly there's no effort at, at, at oral yeah, hygiene yeah. amongst these people. Oh, God, he must have had terrible breath. Chronic halitosis seems to have been a bit of an issue. In Wales, a peasant woman could divorce her husband on the grounds of bad breath. Clearly, they weren't stupid. And historians now believe that the peasant class wasn't as ignorant as was once assumed either. It was all about getting your child in the right school, which in the Middle Ages meant being snapped up by the church. Village priests often taught the sons of villagers their ABC, and perhaps one in ten of these boys would go on into the clergy. Some sons of peasants went on to become high-flying members of the intelligentsia, like this chap here, William of Wickham. William may have been born a humble peasant, but he rose to become the richest and one of the most powerful men in England. He was Lord Chancellor not once, but twice, and he put his fortune to good use. He founded this place, one of the oldest public schools in the country, Winchester College. Oh, very nice. <laughs> William never forgot his origins and he established this school to provide education for 70 boys from peasant backgrounds. Not so many peasants around here nowadays, but William's cryptic motto still hangs above today's pupils. Out disque, out discade. Either learn or go. And then he adds, there is a third choice. Be beaten. Mm. 
But we should be clear that literacy wasn't sought after by the peasants so they could do a spot of bedtime reading or improve their crossword skills. What they wanted was to be able to make out enough words in Latin to check references to themselves and their land in the court rolls. And checking court documents was something that was going to come in very useful for the peasants in the tumultuous times that lay ahead. For most of the 13th and early 14th century, England had an almost Mediterranean feel. Bumper crops and a booming economy and the population doubled. But then that old enemy of the English struck. No, I don't mean the All Blacks, I mean the weather. Heavy rain and low temperatures caused crops to rot and entire villages to sink. People were starving to death. Surely it couldn't get any worse than this. But it could. On top of the famine came something even more dreadful, the Black Death. An already weakened population was devastated. To many people, it seemed that God had deserted them and they struggled to reconcile this terrible catastrophe with their beliefs. Here in the church at Ashwell in Hertfordshire, the plague has left its mark, quite literally. Over 650 years ago, the desperate local priest scratched these words onto the walls of his bell tower. You can see here, it says, Primula Pestis, the first plague, 1349. And then below, he's incised into the walls in deep letters, a big M, that's a thousand and then 350. In 1350, he puts miseranda ferox e violenta. Miserable, fierce, and violent the plague has been. And then below he writes, the dregs of the population are left behind to bear witness, and a mighty wind thunders across the world. The Black Death was a catastrophe. But ironically, those who survived found they were better off than they ever had been. You see, the population of England had been almost halved, and labour was scarce, and ordinary farm workers suddenly found they were in a position to call the shots. Peasants began to refuse to fulfil their feudal duties. They started to negotiate wage increases and even began to be paid in hard cash. <laughs> Some left their manors and acquired their own free land. All this, of course, got up the noses of the aristocracy. If there was more wealth around, they saw no reason why the peasants should have it. So they introduced laws to restore compulsory labour and force wages back down to the levels before the Black Death. But what seems to have especially irritated the aristocracy was the way the peasants were dressing. This season's peasant ditched drab workwear in favour of bright colours, tighter hose and even fur. Some peasants were spending almost the same on clothes as certain noblemen. So laws were introduced dictating what different classes could wear. For example, for any person below the level of craftsman, pointy shoes were a fashion crime. Literally. All of which stoked the fires of peasant resentment. The final straw was when the barons imposed a poll tax to pay for their war in France. This was bitterly resented because it meant that everybody had to pay the same, rich or poor. And to make matters worse, the government got its sums wrong. They based their calculations on the population size before the Black Death. So when they failed to raise the amount they expected, they imposed a second poll tax. And that was when the unthinkable happened. The peasants took up arms and revolted. From all over England, they converged on Canterbury and marched to London, maybe as many as 60,000 of them. With no emails or mobile phones, how could the peasants have organised all this? Could it be that they were making use of their newly acquired literacy to spread word of the revolt? Two of the chroniclers record what they claim were letters that the peasants were circulating amongst themselves. Now, the letters are, are written in English, but they're very cryptic, and we don't really know what they mean. But it could be that they contain detailed, coded instructions for the revolt. This is the one in Thomas Walsingham's Chronicle. And you can see here it says, John Sheep greeteth well John Nameless and John the Miller, and biddeth them chastise well Hob the Robber. 
and look, shape you to one head and no more. Knoweth your friend from your foe, have it enough, and say, who? Now, it may be that when it says, chastise well, hob the robber, those are instructions to the peasants not to do any looting and only to destroy documents and records. And then it says, look, shape you to one head and no more. Well, it could be just instructions saying, just only have one leader. But on the other hand, it may be instructions to go on pilgrimage to Canterbury, where the peasants assembled first. And the focal point was the head of Thomas a Becket. And finally, it says, knoweth your friend from your foe and say who. These could be absolute rigid instructions to distinguish your friends from your enemy by the battle cry. The climax of the Peasants' Revolt must rank as one of the most extraordinary scenes in history. Tens of thousands of rebelling peasants confronted the country's aristocracy, led by the king, a 14-year-old boy. The peasants' leader, Watt Tyler, rode towards the boy king to make his demands and then took a swig from a jug of ale, whereupon the mayor of London charged and cut him down. It looked as if the huge throng were about to attack the aristocracy, but the king suddenly rode forward and shouted, I'll be your leader, follow me! The king granted the peasants pardons and promised to abolish serfdom. But once the rebels had dispersed, the barons quickly set about slaughtering the ringleaders. Thousands of peasants died. The peasants' revolt failed. However, the ideal of freedom and of owing deference to no one was a lasting legacy of the medieval peasant. But there's a sting in the tail to the peasant story. The lords realised that if the peasants were now free from any labour obligation to them, they were likewise free from any obligation to care for their peasants. The social consensus of the feudal system had broken down. And there was worse to come. Peasants were about to come face to face with their real enemy, sheep. You see, your average lord could make more money out of sheep than he could out of peasants. And for a start, there's a lot more wool on a sheep. And you can eat them, which is possible with peasants, but socially tricky. So the lords started to throw the troublesome and uneatable peasants off the land and replace them with these chaps. The social landscape of Britain changed forever. There's nothing intrinsically terrible about the peasants' life. In fact, there were times in the 14th century when it was pretty fine. It deteriorated when the lords fenced in the land. And it got even worse in the Industrial Revolution. And small farmers are still up against it. The life of the peasant depends on the society. But it's sobering to think that compared to a lot of people's lives today, some medieval peasants had it pretty good.